quest for God. The study of religion in the Western world since the dawn of the 17th century has been severely handicapped by neglect of ontology and metaphysics. Questions about metaphysics, such as the precise relationship of God to the world, began to fade during the dawn of early modernity. But the neglect of ontology could not have come at a worse moment. As Europe began to neglect ontology, she also began to have access to an abundance of information about non-Christian religion. The scientific study of religion was unfortunately divorced from theology, and also, beginning in the late 19th century, prevailing through the 20th, uh, 20th century, was severely handicapped by Darwin's theory of evolution, as many scholars wanted religion to fit the Darwinian model of less complex to more complex. I will now attempt to show how if one studies religion from an ontological lens, freed from the bias of evolution or biology, one will find that religion developed from a single, rational, perfect monotheism, or per monotheismos. It is not just monotheism, it is a rational monotheism brought on by intuition and rational contemplation coupled with an experience of the sacred. How long exactly has religion been practiced? It is evident from archaeological evidence, such as cave paintings and ancient burials, that religion, and this is belief in the supernatural, has existed since before humanity even developed a written language. So the question has puzzled uh, academia for a long time. What exactly was the original religion, or, or the ur religion? A number of theories have been proposed over the years to try to account for this original religion. As it shall be demonstrated with careful attention given to noted ethnologist Wilhelm Schmidt and uh, Persian Sufi theologian and philosopher Al Suhardi, the original uh, religion of humankind was monotheism. It was not animism, or polytheism, or pantheism, or atheism. The best demonstration for this is the study of the uh, still existing religious traditions of my primarily primal people today who remain in cultural conditions similar in form to what existed in the prehistoric era. Religions of indigenous people are valid references for prehistoric religion because if there is no documented evidence of a sweeping shift in religious thought, as it exists with the rise of Abrahamic religions, the one has no reason to doubt that their religious beliefs in prehistory were much different. At risk of making an overgeneralization of indigenous people, if there are any established uh, themes, is that not an insight into human history? From the, uh, from the earliest of civilizations, there exists philosophical and scholarly commentary on religion. Many of the earliest thinkers sought to make sense of it. Over the uh, years, religious apologists tried to make sense of religion in some form or another, trying to say what might have had some grain of truth in it, uh, truth in it or what religions were inspired by uh, demonic forces. In the esoteric realm, in the mystical realm, uh, an insightful, uh, influential Islamic philosopher and theologian, also a Harvey, developed a complex uh, religious uh, the philosophy of religious unity, in which he postulated that all the world's religions were bound together by the same inner esoteric mystical uh, core, which uh, was at the heart of these all of these religions on, on earth, was an inner mystical sense which bound them together, which enabled them to achieve, uh, enabled an individual to attain a state of supreme realization. The scientific study of religion, in terms of the modern sense, is generally traced to the anthropologist Edward Tyler, who lived from 1832 to 1917, whose theory on the development of religion still prevails to a certain degree. Tyler who wanted to, who was inspired by Darwin, wanted, up, uh, wanted to prove that all religion passed through several successful, successful stages of development, beginning with a primitive materialism in which societies had no conception of the supernatural, followed by an animism where societies began to believe in spirits, followed by a polytheism in which societies began to worship these spirits as gods and they became exalted in a more transcendent realm, followed by a henotheism which postulated the belief in one god it still acknowledged the existence of these other gods, but not worship them. And finally, uh, a, mo a, a single monotheism could be found amongst the most highly evolved uh, societies. This view was uh, popular and accepted amongst the scientific establishment, although there, there were a few noted individuals who challenged it. Most prominently, the uh, folklorist and writer Andrew Lang, who postulated mainly from 
the existence of supreme beings found amongst Aboriginal Australians, that monotheism was not at the end of civilization, but at the beginning. Quote, Mershaliade, this unexpected anti-evolutionist claim that a high god is not at the end of the religious history, but at the beginnings, did not greatly impress the contemporary scholarly milieu. It is true that uh, Andrew Lang did not master his documentation thoroughly, and in discussion <clears throat> with Heartland, he was compelled to surrender portions of his earlier thesis. Besides, he had the misfortune to be an excellent and versatile writer and author, among other things, and among other things, of a volume of poetry, and literary gifts usually arouse the scholar's suspicions. <laughs> One uh, scholar took so serious the ideas of Andrew Lang, who was known as linguist, anthropologist, and theologian, Wilhelm Schmidt. Schmidt, like Lang, postulated that all religion developed from the belief of a single high god. However, he was different from Lang, and that Lang saw religion as primitive monotheism as being something irrational, a product of superstition, uh, believing that a supernatural entity had caused the natural world. Schmidt, on the other hand, postulated that religion was something purely rational. He believed that his belief in God was not something which was born out of fear and of ignorance, but out of careful philosophical contemplation. Unfortunately, uh, the academic world rejected his thesis uh, because they uh, uh, largely due in part to the rising anti-rationalist trends in Europe at this time, such as surrealism and art, and of course the discovery of the unconscious and the popularity of Nietzsche's existentialism. In his work, The Origin and Growth of Religion, he presents a well-researched and well-reasoned in-depth study. His approach combines history, philosophy, anthropology, theology, and psychology. He not only provides a brilliant explanation and research into the nature of indigenous religion, he also demolishes the popular ethnological uh, theories of his day. However, he was not, as we'll explore later, uh, free from what I would call the ontological and mystical blind spot of the era. He presents a wide array of information in regards to the world's religions, standing against the popular opinion of his time. Namely, he singles out and destroys Max Muller's theory of nature worship, Edward Tyler's theory of animism, Comte's theory of fetishism, and Spencer's theory of ghost worship, and Durkheim and Freud's theory of totemism. And essentially, what is important in what we call the ontological blind spot is that the early scholars of religion were content to look at various base beliefs of indigenous people and look at various practices, but did not want to go further and ask what are and is the ontological symbolism of these actions? Why do these indigenous people do what they do? It is not sufficient at all to say, well, these societies hold sacred a uh, tree or a mountain and a, a river to say, well, they worship uh, this river, they worship this mountain, or they worship this tree. As evidence from the monotheistic religions, uh, the, the holding something in reference does not indicate worship. Uh, for example, consider Hajj. Uh, for Islam, over, uh, there were over a billion Muslims make pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, uh, to the circle of the Kaaba, and the Black Stone, but of course no, uh, no Muslim is worshipping the Black Stone, no Muslim is worshipping the Kaaba, and as later as Marcia Eliade explores in his work, The Sacred Profane, the, these symbols in primitive society are that, these, these, they are indications of the supernatural. And the, because this was ignored by the scholarship in Europe at this time, that is largely how they came to these theories of animism and polytheism. Now, I mentioned before how Schmidt was, how Schmidt was not clear from this ontological blind spot of the era. How Schmidt was not clear in terms of taking into account uh, the symbolism. An example of this is when Schmidt discusses the religion of the ancient Norse when he mentions the example of Odin. Odin, in Norse mythology, uh, was born a human who, left through stages of spiritual ascension, uh, gave, uh, gave his eye to acquire immortality. And Norse believed that the sun was his eye, his eye which wasn't blinded, while the reflection in the water was uh, his eye, which he, had, uh, which he had blind himself. Schmidt just assumes this is the as a gen uh, the generation from an earlier form of monotheism, but had he looked more closely and seen the similarities between this uh, realization in the story of Odin with the realization of Islamic and Christian mystics as they passed through series of stages of spiritual realization, he would have seen that Odin is simply, in uh, the terminology of Christian mysticism, a 
male, a universal man who has succeeded in uh, attaining these levels of spirit, uh, spiritual realization and having uh, purged their created natures and received one with the infinite nature. Now, supplement his point about the idea of religion being something primarily irrational and this monotheism being rational, we must consider the uh, ontological argument for God's existence. The most profound, which is the most profound and powerful argument, and much more powerful than either the design argument and the, or the cosmological argument, has these are only supplementary to the ontological argument and, all, and are subservient to ontology. It will henceforth be demonstrated that not only is the ontological argument irrefutable, and that without it, all the other arguments make no sense, but it will be that it was held by primal people long before it was in either Islamic or Christian scholasticism. The ontological argument, which is generally associated with St. Anne's own is as follows. Things in reality are greater than things in the understanding. This is in reality. And this is well, this proves the existence of God, because things in, if you think of something, you must be assuming what exists, uh, it has to have the attribute of something which exists in reality. It has to have the attribute of uh, something which you observe, of something which exists in the real world. If you're conceiving of something like geocentric cosmology, your Santa Claus, these things which don't exist that we can conceive of. Only